Thanks, Lori. Good morning. My name is Krista de la Cruz, and I am a volunteer at the Lupus Foundation of Northern California. I'm excited to be your moderator this morning session. We have a packed schedule today, so I will go over the agenda quickly, and then we will get started. The first session, we will have a presentation from Dr. Alvin Wells, who will discuss Get Uncomfortable Prioritizing Lupus and Your Kidneys, a discussion. In our second session, uh, we welcome lupus patient Satara Banis Satter as she presents self care, stress management, and sleep, laying the groundwork for healing. Each of our sessions will end with a 15 minute QA. And remember, you can ask your questions at any time. We will be gathering the questions and asking them after the appropriate presentation. You can also ask your question anonymously by clicking the anonymous button. Now I'd like to introduce Danny Martinez from ARENA to introduce Dr. Wells. All right, thanks, Krista. Good morning, everyone. My name is Danny Martinez, and I'm a Strategic Alliance Manager with ARENIA. And I'd like to thank Lori and LFNC for the opportunity to partner with them and welcome you to today's discussion, Get Uncomfortable Prioritizing Lupus and Your Kidneys. As you may be aware, ARENIA makes the medicine for adults with lupus nephritis. However, today's presentation will not discuss any medicines and will focus on the importance of early detection through routine testing and management of lupus nephritis. We look forward to sharing information about our medicine at a future program. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce your speaker for today's program, Dr. Alvin Wells. Dr. Wells is a, currently a practicing rheumatologist and director of the Aurora Rheumatology and Immunotherapy Fra Center in Franklin, Wisconsin. He is an assistant clinical professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin and maintains his clinical affiliation with Duke University in North Carolina, where he is an adjunct assistant professor. Dr. Wells received his medical degree from the University of South Florida and trained in internal medicine and rheumatology at Duke University. He received his PhD in, immuno, in immuno, immunology from the University of South Carolina. Dr. Wells has over 25 years of research experience focusing on chronic inflammatory diseases. Dr. Wells in, is an internationally renowned speaker and researcher and has had research from the Arthritis Foundation and from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And with that, Dr. Wells, you may begin. Well, thank you, Danny and Krista, and thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day to, to join this presentation. Looking forward to hearing from Sotera as well. Uh, like Danny said, I'm a busy rheumatologist, and we treat all aspects of uh, rheumatic disorders uh, and definitely focusing on lupus. Uh, you know, I have a lot of people ask me, oh, how do I get lupus? You know, we don't really know what triggers the disease, but we, we make the analogy. Do you get these angry cells that start turning in the body? Uh, lupus comes from the word that means wolf, and you get this rash in the face that looks like a wolf or a German shepherd. Uh, uh, ladies can uh, get not only get the rash, but it can lose the hair, it can get into the joints, and it also can get into the kidneys. And this is what we call lupus nephritis. And part of the goal here is to make sure patients are aware of what lupus and lupus nephritis looks like, but also making you get uncomfortable, like we're saying. You know, we use the term seeing is believing, but you see the picture here, it talks about peeing in a cup. So peeing is believing. Uh, you really want to get uncomfortable and talk about this as well. Uh, let's see here. Can we go to the next slide? The slides, I don't know if they're in a PowerPoint uh, format. They don't look like it to me. And if you like, I can share, try sharing them. They're not moving. I'm not seeing anything other than the title slide. Hey, Danny, are you seeing anything? Uh, no. Um, maybe, can, would you like to just share? Uh, Laura, can you give him the... Uh... Well, let's try that. Um, let's see. I thought I pulled them up. Let's make sure if I got them here. Um Give me two seconds, guys. Laura, they didn't look like a PowerPoint presentation. So oh, sorry about that. I can't quite get it out of. I don't know what's up with my system today. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we got here. 
All righty, so now we go back to Zoom and I am able to share screen and we have them here. Perfect. All righty, so that's the first slide. Uh, go back here. Uh, so getting uncomfortable and you see the cup that we were talking about. Uh, I, I was alluding to the lupus is a, is a chronic disease. Uh, we don't know what triggers it, um, but we do know that patients who get it are, are, are ladies of childbearing age. I have patients in the, that are teens, 18, 19, 20 years old that have it and also have lupus nephritis. We know that some people uh, that this inflammation, uh, like I, I talked about, can get into the kidneys. You look on the right-hand side of the slide here, 50% uh, of patients may go on to get kidney involvement, and that's what we call lupus nephritis. Uh, it's a common uh, uh, this, uh, uh, a presentation that we see with patients with lupus. And what we worry about, that those same angry cells that, like I said, it can damage the skin. You guys know the Singer um, seal. You see that uh, the scars on his face? That's not acne. That's actually from lupus. So the same type of thing, imagine that inside of your kidneys. I like to make the analogy. You all had an old sponge that you have in your kitchen sink. When you take it out of the bag, it's nice and sweat. It smells good and it works and absorbs very nicely. But over a period of weeks, it gets hard, it won't absorb, it won't work like it should. And that's what happens with the kidneys, with lupus. So going from that nice uh, functional kidney to end up with the scarring. And unfortunately, some patients can end up where they not, not only the kidney works anymore, they can have, uh, have to require dialysis or have transplant. I have a, a sister who's older than me, unfortunately, she's on dialysis now and that's no walk in the park. So we wanna make sure that, hey, patients with lupus who might have lupus nephritis, they know what it looks like and definitely make sure uh, your rheumatologist stay on top of that. People think it's, it's uncommon, but it's not as uncommon as you think. Look here, about 100,000 people currently living in the United States that we know about have lupus nephritis. So one in three people diagnosed with lupus at the time of diagnosis, think about that. I have three patients with lupus walk into my clinic. I've never seen them, never laid hands on them, never made the diagnosis. But if I diagnose them with lupus, one of those three ladies is gonna have lupus nephritis at the first visit. And that's what I tell my patients here. Yes, we need to be very, very aggressive. We wanna make sure we get not only do the blood work, I'm gonna do my physical exam, but we're gonna do a test on your urine to make sure you don't have kidney disease. So again, more common in women than in men and often can be more severe in, in uh, women as well. Look on the right-hand side here. We're all talking about disparities and equity and inclusion now. We know that the racial and ethnic groups have a higher rate of having lupus nephritis. Compared with Caucasian and white people, are four times more common in African-Americans and Asian descent patients, and also two times more common uh, higher in Hispanic and Native American. So like I tell people, if I have a patient of color, I'm gonna be very, very aggressive with them. I give another kind of story. I have a boring girl twin. Both of my kids are healthy, thank God. But if my young daughter developed lupus, I'm going to be very, very aggressive. I'm going to follow her three to four months every year to making sure that we uh, don't see any changes. I have to get the blood test. I have to do a physical exam. And she would have to get a urine test to make sure that's not going to pop up all of a sudden. And that's the take home message for the day's presentation. Uh, so getting uncomfortable. There's some facts about, like I said, one in three people living with lupus nephritis will go on to get kidney failure. So once you've been diagnosed with lupus nephritis, Despite aggressive therapy, 33% of those patients will go on and have to end up with dialysis or end up with a kidney transplant. And now we have guidelines that say in the middle here that yes, you need to be seen every three months. I'm a busy physician, I'm booking out six to nine months, but I still need that blood work. I still need the urine test every three months. And that's the nice thing about being in those virtual world. I can do a virtual visit with a patient, but she still needs to go to the lab to get a blood test. She still needs to go to the lab to get a urine sample every three months. And also part of that blood test that we're looking at is making sure not only damage from the disease, but damage from my drugs. We'd like to look at your blood count. We'd like to look at your, your liver function. We'd like to also look at your renal function as well, the kidney function. And on the right-hand side here, you see the risk of death is three times higher in patients who have lupus nephritis. So as you go from lupus, you go from lupus nephritis, 33% chance of having kidney failures. And not only that, three times more greater chance of having a death. So I have a lady who has lupus, that lady with lupus nephritis, her risk for dying young, dying early, is actually three times greater. And that's really, really striking. Think about this. These patients with lupus, they're not 70, 80, 90 years old, right? Teens, 20s, or 30 years old. The average age is 30 years old. That means half the people are younger and half the people are older. So can you think about somebody 32 years old diagnosed with lupus, she gets lupus nephritis, and without aggressive treatment, she can go on and have a die. 
30, 40 years old. It's really kind of sad. And that's why we want to talk about this. So what are the things we look at? What are the complications when we think about lupus nephritis? Go back to that sponge. You have to spill some water on the sink counter. You try to dry, get it up with that dried sponge. It's not going to work. So the same thing happened. If a kidney's eye function like it should, guess what? Uh, you're not uh, getting rid of urine and things like that. And things build up. And one of the things we see as fluid builds up is like imagine a dam building up. That pressure builds up and it builds up your blood pressure. And indeed, that's what most ladies die from. It's a blood pressure and cardiovascular disease here. I'll go right to the third block that you see here. The cardiovascular complication. They have a heart attack. They have strokes. All of those things. And that can enter, of course, early mortality like we talked about. And the second box here, that scarring. Think about that sponge analogy that we talked about, that chronic kidney disease. You know you can live with uh, two uh, with one kidney. Some people can donate a kidney if somebody needs to. But what we worry about, if, uh, if a lady has two kidneys and she's functioning like she only has 50% of a kidney function, that's a bad sign. So it goes down from, uh, uh, from 60 to 50 to 30 to 20, even with uh, my aggressive therapies. And this is something that we keep our eyes on. And on the right-hand side here, you see if they get kidney failure, known as end-stage kidney disease, that's the time we walk walking with our uh, nephrologist, the kidney specialist, to say, hey, is this a patient who's a candidate for a kidney transplant? Or if there's no transplant, can we go on and get to see about dialysis? We got to catch it early, guys. Think about this. Uh, we all treat our blood pressure. We all treat our cholesterol. We all treat our diabetes. And the same thing here, we need to treat the lupus and lupus nephritis. We need to make it the diagnosis early. Like I said, when they come into my clinic, we get the urine ed baseline in every three months. We're going to talk about treatment and then routine testing to make sure I do as much as I can as a rheumatologist to prevent this irreversible damage that you see that we mentioned here in the box at the bottom. So what are signs and symptoms to look at? Again, going back to that sponge, instead of being nice and moist and absorbing water like it should, it's hard and crackly, won't do anything at all. And when that water builds up, guess what? It leads to swelling of the ankles. You all take your socks off at night. You see that little line around your ankles? That line should be gone in the mornings. It's natural for all of us to have that throughout the day. If you see that ring in the morning, you need to be calling your doctor. You need to message him. Hey, I'm still seeing this, what we call this edema, the swelling of my legs. That is not normal. And a lot of my call, oh, yeah, just go elevate your feet at night, get a pillow, or put some compression holes on there. No, if you got lupus, I'm worried that it could be lupus nephritis. We're not going to wait. If you're my daughter, I'm not going to wait. You end up on dialysis. And that's what we talk about. When that fluid builds up, guess what? The blood pressure builds up. And then I'm worried about your blood pressure, heart attacks, and strokes. So we got to be aggressive with that. So indeed, I jump all over this. My primary care doctors who treat my lupus nephritis patients are not aggressive in lowering that blood pressure. Guess what? We jump on it ourselves. I have high blood pressure on my medication. My systolic blood pressure is 116. I don't, the same thing my lupus pay. They come, oh yeah, 130, 135. No, that's not normal. We've got to get that down. Less than 120 is where we want it to be. And then what does it look like in the urine? I'll give my age away. You know, as a kid, we had the little milk cartons in school and we take the little straw and we blow in that milk and you see that kind of bubbles come up uh, because milk has got protein in it, right? And that's what it looks like with urine um, when you have lupus nephritis. You, 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 you urinate and you look down in water, you see all these bubbles that are there. And even as you fl uh, flush, you can see that. So that frothy, sudsy urine or going to the bathroom frequently, that's one of the signs. So swelling of the ankles that won't go away overnight, elevated blood pressure above 130, and then you see this frothy urine. That's what you need to talk to your doctors about. And then down below here, we're going to look for signs. Hey, is it coming from leaking of, of the urine? So we're looking at things called proteinuria. Uh, see if that's causing uh, one of the things we look at is look at how much protein is in the urine. We look for the blood test too. Uh, look for blood in the urine as well. And then we do your lap electrolytes. Everybody knows about sodium, potassium, um, a magnesium, all those different things we look at. And then we want to look at the glomerular filtration rate. How much is that water going through the hose? Uh, how is it going through like a fire hose? Is this trickling like a little spigot? And that's what we want to make sure. So you have a decrease in that filtration rate. That's not normal. And when that happens, things are not being excreted like it should. It builds up in the blood. And one thing we'll look at, it increases creatinine levels. And then, I keep coming back to my analogy about the sponge, you get that scarring. And when it's scarred, the cat's out of the bag. I can't do anything for it. I have nothing to make a scar go away. You all have had surgery. Some people have keloids. Once that scar and everything's there, try as I might, I can't make it go away. So scarring is the end result. It's the body's attempt to say, hey, we got some damage here. Let's do what we can to kind of wall that off so it doesn't cause more damage to other parts of the kidneys. And that's what that scarring leads to. And unfortunately, we can't reverse that.
So we have tests to help us di diagnose this lupus nephritis to stay ahead of it. Peeing in a cup. I tell you, what, peeing is believing. It's, uh, 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 you know, it's uncomfortable, but you have to do it every three months, guys. And if you have lupus and your rheumatologist is not doing it, guys, you need to question, hey, I heard a doctor speak the other day and they said, I should be getting a urine test every three months. Oh, yeah, nothing to worry about. Just sit back and ask and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. If it was somebody in your family, it was your daughter who had lupus, would you not be checking her urine? And am I not paying you money for your my your best advice? I'm your customer. I want this test done. I don't care what you think. And here's one little pearl I tell share with my patients. But you guys saw a doctor for do a test and they say no. Okay, Dr. Wells, I appreciate that you don't want that, but can you just document in my chart that I asked you for that test and you declined? Guess what? You'll get the test left and right, right? Because they don't want to be responsible. They won't be liable. Well, that's what you do. You want you need an MRI, you need a CT scan, you want a urine test. The doctor said, no, I don't think it's a thing, kid. You're fine, honey. You're fine, sugar. I hate when they do that. Well, document that in my chart, and then we can have a discussion. So the urine test every three months, along with the blood test as well. And indeed, if I think you have it, I see abnormal uh, changes in your urine, abnormal changes in the blood. I'm going to call them up my, my kidney specialist, the nephrologist. I need to do a biopsy. Everybody think the biopsy, they're cutting on your nose. You're lying on your stomach on the table. They numb up your lower back with the kidney. It's the same stuff that dentists use when you're going for the uh, for tooth removal or for filling. And they're going with a small needle and take a biopsy of that. A little sliver of kidney. You can look at that on the microscope. And of the six different types of kidney disease, is it type three? Is it type four, type five? Whatever type it is, because all of those are going to be treated a little differently. Get the urine test. Get the blood test. And when I'm worried, we get that biopsy to see, help me talk about it. And there's some numbers we talk about. You don't really need to remember these, but we talk about how many grams, how much weight is the is protein that we see in the urine. Irreversible kidney damage may occur when protein levels reach 0.5 grams per day. And if your urinalysis shows proteinuria higher than that, then it's an implication that your doctor needs to be treated and talk about treatment options to bring that protein level down. It's not normal to have protein in the urine. Your body's smart. The urine is, uh, the kidneys are like a dam to kind of prevent you from leaking certain things out of the kidneys in the urine. And if when kidneys get damaged from lupus, they get all leaky, and we can see that uh, that protein in the urine, which not should be shouldn't be there. We keep coming back to the rule of threes. It should be there every three months, uh, and you're getting that test like clockwork. Don't be frustrated. Don't be this scared about getting the, the, the blood test and the and urine test, but we got to get that long term, guys, because we want to make sure you don't end up with kidney and, and damage. Choosing to prioritize your kidney health might be uncomfortable, like I talked about, but so are some other things. I mean, you could go by the dialysis center. Uh, you see uh, things, uh, uh, these patients have to go in three times a week. Uh, when they got this little um, this catheter in for, uh, for the dialysis, they can get infections. I mean, scarring is a lot. It's no, it's no walk in the park like we talked about. And my sister's finding that out the hard way. Managing the daily struggles of lupus can feel like a full-time job. It is. Uh, you need to have get your family members involved. Make sure you have a dedicated care specialist. And make sure you have someone you can reach out to at the clinic. It might be me, it might be my nurse and my medical assistant, so they know how, oh, gosh, Mrs. Smith's calling in again. She's the one with lupus and arthritis. I need to make sure we're on top of this. Here, Dr. Wells, here's the message. What do we need to do to make sure that she doesn't have any issues? You see the concern? And by the way, you're paying me to do that. That's what, that, I, you're my customer. If you miss appointments, guess what? Uh, things happen. Uh, you know, I tell people, hey, you miss appointment, call your doctor up, say, hey, Dr. Wells, can I turn this into a telephone visit? They might say, no, no, no. The answer is they're wrong they can turn into a telephone visit. You can say, hey, y'all, just get on the phone. Let's go over your lab, see how you're doing. Ask some questions. Okay, I'm going to send an order in for the urine and the blood test, and then let's make another follow-up appointment. People get busy. You got things at work. You got projects and things that come up. The other family members got sick. You have to be up all night with a kid. And these, oh, my God, Dr. Wells, I had an appointment at 830. I can't make it today, but can I do a telephone call? The answer is yes, you can. And that's what you tell your, your, your providers. So what's the goal? Encourage people living with lupus and lupus nephritis to visit your doctor routinely and engage in these discussions and talk about this lupus nephritis. Hey, I have lupus. My disease is under control. But are you checking my, my urine to make sure I don't have any other changes? Like we say, peeing in a cup sucks. But being on dialysis, um, you didn't have a kidney transplant, that's even worse. Uh, and that's what we talk about. So kidney failure is something you don't want to do. You got to prioritize this. Lupus is a chronic disease. The old days, I hated it because we had a, uh, we didn't have as many treatment options now. And Danny alluded to, we have a lot of different options out there. Every patient is different. Um, so we need to talk with your rheumatologist, talk with your nephrologist to say, hey, now my disease is getting worse. What can I do? And actually, before you get there, what can we do to prevent that? And you have ways to find a doctor uh, as well. 
You are your best advocate. I tell people that I like this all. People get all afraid and say, oh, the doctor, doctor, I don't want to upset the doctor. I don't want to ask any questions. You're paying the doctor. It's not the other way around, guys. I, I'm not ashamed about it. I said, you know, I'm a business person. You pay me money for my best advice, and that's what you get. And I treat you like you would be somebody in my family. I talk about my, my daughter, right? If she got lupus, I'm not going to wait till she ends up on dialysis. We're going to be over this like clockwork, and that's what they should be doing too. Make your doctors uncomfortable. Dr. Wells, why aren't you doing that test? Dr. Wells, why is my blood pressure, you know, 135, 140? You know, can I get this test? Can I do all these different things? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. Do you mind just documenting my chart that I requested that and you said no? Then you got some things down the road you can talk about that. Here's a QR code that talks about you can help you find a specialist in your area. This Dr. Finder too, uh, you know, or rheumatologist, a nephrologist that does all this stuff. So these are things you want to think about. So as you talk about here, you can see my passion. Uh, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing to be in this space, to be able to have some um, options for our patients who have lupus and lupus nephritis. So um, lupus is a chronic disease. Lupus nephritis can occur in one of three patients at diagnosis. Lupus, once you get lupus nephritis, your chance of having kidney damage and dying is higher than somebody without lupus nephritis. And you make sure you want to see your doctor on a regular basis to get your blood, do an exam, but also to get your urine test. So let me stop there and turn it back over to our moderator. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Krista, are we taking questions now or how are we doing? Uh, yeah, we will be starting the Q&A session soon. Perfect, okay, well, great. All right, I'll turn it back over to you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wells, for your presentation. It was very, very informative. Now we will open the Q&A portion of this event. We will begin with the questions that were asked during the presentation, but feel free to ask additional questions while we are talking. We will try to get through as many questions as we can live and we'll email you answers to any questions that we are not able to get to today. Don't forget, everyone who's attending, you can type your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom or the top, depending on your Zoom, or you can type them in your chat area as well. Um, so don't be shy. And if you want to do it anonymously, there's an anonymous. You could click the anonymous button as well. Should we give them a minute? Um, sure. Why don't you ask the first question that came in and then... Okay. Chats as well. I got a question in the chat. Is SLE and lupus nephritis the same? So no. So SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, and that we abbreviate just lupus. Uh, that's the one I talked about. You can get this rash. You get uh, hair loss, which we call alopecia. You get sores in the nose and mouth. You can get arthritis. Uh, you get uh, rash in your chest. Uh, you can also get uh, lung disease, uh, heart disease, and then kidney disease. So systemic lupus, again, affects the whole body inside and out. Uh, one in three patients with lupus will go on to develop lupus nephritis, those angry cells that get into the kidneys we've been talking about, and that's the lupus nephritis. Chris, I see the comment here. Somebody saying about their eight-year-old daughter was yeah. uh, recently diagnosed with lupus. Uh, you know, that's good news and bad news. The bad news, she has a diagnosis. The good news is that we have treatments we can do even for pediatric lupus. And that's where your, your doctor needs to be definitely on top of that. Uh, just like I made the analogy, was my daughter, uh, we're not going to wait. If they're just sitting back and not doing the tests and you follow up on a routine basis, uh, you need to make sure you get uh, a second opinion. I throw that out there too, because some patients say, oh, I don't want to upset my doctor. But before you go through some major surgery, before you do some other things, or your doctor's not being as aggressive as you think, there's nothing wrong with getting a second opinion. I tell people all the time, hey, is you got another provider who can tell me, hey, Dr. Wells, have you thought about this? Hey, Dr. Wells, have you seen this new drug? Oh my gosh, I'm all over it. I would help me do my job better. And that's one thing we think about. So as well, Krista. Turn. I have another comment or question that says, how often do you see male patients? Have you seen it be more aggressive in males? So yes, we do see male patients with it. Of course, lupus is three to five times more common in female patients, but the male patients can be more aggressive. They can actually have kidney disease. Um, they do present a little bit uh, older, so not in their teens. They might be 20 or 30 years old uh, when they have the diagnosis. But if they have skin disease, for example, we're doing a biopsy to make that diagnosis. 
We have new blood markers we can do as well. And absolutely, we have, we're doing the um, the urine on them. Male patients that you know more likely have cardiovascular disease, so we're all over the blood pressure. If they're overweight, do using weight loss meds, checking the cholesterol and all those different things. I do that. I get the ball rolling. I'm not waiting on an internist, a primary care doctor. We do that and can make those thing, um, make those referrals to a primary care specialist if we need to. So yeah, male patients, just like the female, I make at the end of the day, if you have lupus, you need to be all over this, getting uncomfortable uh, with this, making sure you don't have lupus nephritis because th that can be an issue for a number of patients. I have another question here. How, how do I know if I have protein in my urine? Yes, yeah, so the symptoms we talked about, something you can see. So first of all, um, it, protein in urine, it can be associated with swelling of the ankles that we talked about. But the most common thing is if you look at your urinate, and many people don't like to look down the water, but look at the water. As that urine is coming through, if all of a sudden you see in all these bubbles, all of a sudden you feel like, hey, you're now having to go to the bathroom more frequently, that could be a sign of something going on. In the definitive way, we go to the doctor, you get a urine sample, and we test that. We can see how much protein there is there, and also do that test in the urine and compare it to what we see in the blood. So those two tests together let us know if there's any issues with protein in the urine that we need to be concerned about. What do you what do you suggest for someone newly diagnosed? What should they do to prepare for their first appointment? And what can they do to help you and themselves? Um, I love that question because I tell people to be prepared. Uh, you know, there's this TV commercial where you see uh, a man goes in to, I don't know, somewhere like Best Buy to buy a phone. And he asks, okay, can I do text? Can I do all of our call? Does it do all the stuff, photos and all those different things? And then it shows the same man going to the doctor and said, do you have any questions? He said, no. So it was like silent. So he's asking more about a cell phone than he was about his own health. And that's the thing I tell my patients. I love it. If you saw something on the news or pay a news article in a newspaper on Sunday, bringing that in. Or you hear something on a TV commercial, you talk about a friend who's on a medication, bring that in. Because uh, again, I'm going to give you my advice what that means. Write down questions. Hey, this is what I've heard. This is what a friend told me. Can I take turmeric and garlic and all this stuff, right? I'm going to tell you all the real world, all those different things. So writing things down. Um, I have people too. You want to bring somebody in there. Uh, you know, another pair of eyes and ears. is uh, I talk fast. <laughs> uh, so you want to have somebody in the room with you. But be prepared. If you have somebody in the room, I'm going to ask them intimate questions. So if I ask you about intercourse and sexually transmitted diseases or whatever, you need to make sure that, that that's okay to in there. Uh, I also have people say, hey, I got a, a, a young lady. Her husband's at work, but he's going to take 15 minutes from his job to kind of, uh, listen in by phone. and Or I want to record this so I can go back. And the doctor said, uh, no, 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 you can't record this. You need to go. So thank you. Go back and get your copay and find another doctor, right? Because, you know, I, I have nothing wrong with you recording stuff. You say, yes, I want to go back and see what Dr. Wells said. I want to share this with my husband, with my kids. I want to go back and talk about all the stuff. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And you should not be, because this is a virtual space. When I do on video things like this, this thing could be recorded. It could be captured out there. So writing things down, bringing information in, having somebody else with you, uh, asking questions, and actually even recording the conversation. I think all those things you need to do with any of your visits, not just with me, your primary care doctor. You know, you got somebody who's overweight. Oh, yeah, you just need to go out and exercise, honey. No, give me one of those weight loss drugs. They're approved by insurance. I can lose 40 pounds in a month. And then my blood pressure, my diabetes, my cholesterol goes away. But they're not doing it. They'll give it to their daughters, their, their wives, everybody else in their family, but they won't do it for the patients who you, they're paying money, you're paying money for. I get so frustrated when I see my colleagues do all this stuff. So yeah, those, those are my pearls I tell my patients all the time. Krista, you're muted. Sorry, I have another question. It says, I have lupus and stage three kidney disease. My doctor told me the kidney disease is inside my kidney due to my high blood pressure medication. I'm due to ooh labs every month. Do you think it's nephritis? So yes, it could be, and you need a kidney biopsy. Uh, so I'm just looking at the question here. So the only way to tell if it's coming from, uh, from blood pressure and everything like that is we got to do a biopsy. Uh, the blood pressure and diabetes can cause a different pattern in the kidneys, uh, and we can see that on the biopsy, and that's the best way to tell. 
So I said, yes, I, I'm, I want a kidney biopsy. He said, oh, no, honey, I don't think you need a biopsy. You need to find another doctor. Because, again, there's six different types of kidney disease. I don't know which type it is. If it's got a scarring, none of my drugs are going to work. But if it's certain different stages of it, I can use the different drugs now to get that under control to make sure it doesn't get worse. And now you see some of the TV commercials, even with chronic kidney disease, they got drugs that can keep it from progressing and maybe decrease it, going from stage three down to a stage two. If you're not on one of those medications, it's time to get a second opinion and find another doctor. Next, we have, do you know how or why phosphate levels connect with lupus? We cannot seem to be able to raise them even after being on phosphate treatment for about a month now. Yeah, so low phosphate not only be coming from loss of the kidney, but it means that your body's probably not absorbing it through the gut. So I probably recommend being seen by a GI specialist or a nutritionist. So they, there are different formulations of phosphorus that you can do to get that up. Um, it doesn't really impact the kidney function like we see like potassium and calcium and magnesium, but your body needs phosphate to gen generate energies to, to recover muscle and cells. So you definitely want to make sure it's in that normal range. If it's low, I'm okay, but I don't want it down here. So doing what you can to make sure it's in that normal range and then also seeing if it's being absorbed in the GI system. Uh, anything else in the chat, anything from your side? I have some other questions that we can go off of. Well, if people want to continue adding to the chat. So yes. Um, yes, going go back ahead. to protein in the urine, what would be the next step a renal doctor would do if I do have protein? Yes, if you do have protein in the urine, we're going to do a biopsy, the kidney biopsy. Like I said, you'd, you'd go to a nephrologist. If we can't get you into a nephrologist, we get you to radiology because I want that test done as soon as possible. And then based on that, I'll know which direction to go with my treatment. I'll know which type of kidney disease it is. And while I'm waiting on that, guess what? We're going to put you on stuff to control your blood pressure. If your primary care doctor if that doesn't don't have you on something for your diabetes or for weight loss, we start those drugs ourselves. Uh, we are very aggressive. Why? Because lupus can affect the whole body, not just the kidneys, the skin, the joints. It goes from head to toe, guys. And that's the message. And these doctors are not being aggressive. It's so frustrating for me to see patients coming in for a second or third opinion. And I said, the doctor didn't talk about this. The doctor didn't check that. I mean, it just blows you away. It makes you cry. And that's why I said, if your doctors are not doing stuff and you ask for a procedure or test or whatever, ask them to document it. And then you can go from there. Also, does having protein mean I would develop kidney failure? So, yes, um, protein is one of the things that can get into, and it kind of is like uh, the analogy is like a clog in the drain. So if you got the drain, the hair or whatever gets in, the water kind of builds up. So protein and other kind of things like salts, like calcium and things like that can get deposited in, in the kidneys because the body's not able to clear it like a normal kidney would be. So once the kidney function is not working like it should, Things are not flowing like it should. Imagine, like I said, a fire hose versus a spigot just dripping. So your body's not flushing things through like it normally should and things back up and that can lead to more damage. And that's what we can see as well. Thank you, Dr. Wells. If anyone else has questions, please feel free to put it in the chat before we can move on. Oh, oh I see one. My grandmother, mom, and I were diagnosed with lupus SLE. Do you know what genes are associated with lupus and can you screen for them? So yes, there are genes that are associated with it, but I'll tell you the short answer is uh, that's not worth testing. Uh, the insurance company won't pay for it and it'll be uh, thousands of dollars. Because here's the, the challenge is, uh, even if the gene test positive, I have nothing to put you on to prevent lupus. I'm not going to put you on one of these drugs unless you got it. But what I do tell you, say all of a sudden, if you, let's say in the family, you have a young kid who complains about joint pain and the family history of lupus, that kid needs to be seen by a doctor to make sure, hey, there's a family history of lupus. I want to make sure this joint pain is not coming from, uh, from a beginning signs of lupus. I said, for example, because somebody mentioned an eight-year-old daughter, you know, kids don't make up stuff. If a kid has pain, you better believe them. I tell the joke too. If my kids say the ghost in the house, I'm moving because they really are seeing ghosts, right? I'm, I'm not going to play around with it. So no, so don't worry about a genetic testing. Um, believe you know your body better than anybody else. You know your family. If things start changing, hey, I think you got some issue. You got a rash. You got some joint pain. 
I see swelling in your legs. Let's get you to a real doctor who can do this evaluate and make sure uh, makes uh, you know, make get you appropriate therapy. The other thing we worry about, say if we do do a test that's positive for a gene, and now you got those people want to do 23 and me and all this uh, crazy stuff, which I don't believe in. Now you got a gene that's out there positive. We don't know ethically, can an insurance company say, okay, now we're not going to cover you down the road because you got this pre-existing gene like we do for cancer. You test positive for certain genes, you had increased risk for breast or, or uterine cancer. And so now preventative ladies can go in and get all the surgery like Angelina Jolie did. She'd had everything removed, right? So uh, you want to say, hey, now what can I do? You got a gene for lupus. I have nothing. I can't remove things in your body. I can't put you on thing to prevent that. It just means you develop signs and symptoms. I don't care what it is, skin, joint, whatever. See the doctor. Let them know that family history and we get you treated appropriately. Next question. I have no family history of lupus, but was recently diagnosed in my 50s of pleurisy caused by lupus. What caused that? Um, I don't know if you're seen by a rheumatologist, but if you haven't, you need a second opinion. It's very unusual to see somebody in their 50s develop lupus that presents just a pleurisy. So lupus can affect what we call the lining of the lungs and the heart. Uh, so that we can see that as well, but it has some blood tests that we see that are positive. And then we're looking for other things. Did they do a biopsy to show that it indeed is that? Uh, so that's some of the things we look at. One thing we know that say, hey, it could be coming from infection, from viruses can trigger stuff, the pleurisy around the lining of the lungs. But I mentioned lupus can affect the whole body and it also can affect the lungs, but you gotta be seen by a rheumatologist. They need to do this blood work. We got a test that we do is look at 40 different markers. It not only tells me if you're positive or negative, it tells me what's the likelihood your disease will get worse and worse and worse. So if you're testing that positive range, guess what? We might not do the blood work in urine at three months. We might do it every other month just to make sure that you're not going to end up in dialysis two or three months from now. So if you're not seen by a board-certified rheumatologist, you need to get somebody to see you because that that um, you know we want to make sure that it is uh, coming from lupus and that you're on appropriate therapy. And guys, the good news is we have therapy. When I did my fellowship at Duke, I hated lupus because these patients didn't do well. We had to put them on all these chemotherapy poisons. Now we got multiple drugs we can use to treat the, treat the lupus, to treat the lupus nephritis. And it's really, really been rewarding to be able to have all these treatment options for our patients. You go to some doctors, they're not going to recommend it, guys. I see it. I say, oh, we're going to give you the older drugs, drugs from the 80s and yada, yada, yada. Uh, we don't do that because we all we worry about the cost of these drugs. I don't worry about the cost, guys. I say, why are we talking about the cost? I say, we should not talk about the cost of these drugs. You should talk about the worth. And all of my patients are worth it. So that's what we do when we talk about that. But some doctors, they're not there unless it's their mother, their wife, their daughter, right? You see the analogy? So with the lung disease, see a doctor and make sure they got it and do a biopsy. But you need to be followed regularly to make sure this doesn't get worse and lead to other organ involvement like the kidneys. Do the drugs that are prescribed for kidney issues heal the kidney disease? So when we talk about healing, that means that say, hey, uh, you've been healed, I can stop medications and boom, you're gone. Unfortunately, we don't have that in rheumatology because the drugs uh, uh, that we use, they kind of uh, fine tune the immune system. So imagine when you're young and balanced, you're healthy like a scale, you're balanced, right? Something with lupus has got the scales kind of tilted here. So I want to see it do much as I can to get that scale back to balance as much as I can. I can't get it quite back to 100%. And I definitely don't want to go down here because it's causes side effects. So we, that's why we got to get these medications. I might stop some of these medications or decrease the dose. And if things kind of go back up and down, it's like a yin and a yang. So it doesn't heal things, but it prevents things from getting worse. But now we have damage uh, uh, data to say, hey, uh, with lupus over the years, without treatments, towards some of our treatments, the kidneys will get worse and worse and worse and worse. Now we're on some of our medication. We can prevent the, the organ damage that instead of going up like a rocket, that it might go up just slowly like this over years, 10, 15 to 20 years. So in 20 years, you might be here as opposed to here without aggressive treatment. And that's why I get on some of my colleagues, get these patients started from day one on these drugs and not wait till the cat's out of the bag. Do I need to change my diet at all to keep my kidneys healthy? Short answer is yes. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, that we all need to be eating healthy. Uh, so I tell people, look in your closet and your refrigerator, all those white things, you need to put those away. So the rice, the cereal, uh, the white bread, uh, the white potatoes. Uh, you know, you eat cereal, oatmeal, but maybe limited to once a week. 
uh, instead of uh, mashed potatoes, eat mashed cauliflower. Instead of baked potato, eat a baked uh, sweet potato. And then want to increase the amount of protein. It's going to be eggs. It's going to be beans and peas. It's going to be avocado. I know food is expensive now, but this is what people need to be doing. And also, I'm not a big fan of vitamins. I tell people my, my grandparents couldn't go to Walmart years ago and get vitamins. You know, they ate the fresh fruits and vegetables, the fresh milk, the cheese, and eggs and sausage, all those kind of things are what they what they did. Also, vitamins have colors and fillings in them. You know, that yellow, that orange, all that's not natural. So all these different fillers. Here's one little pearl. Anybody taking vitamins, they usually get this question. You can take a third of a glass of vinegar. Vinegar is about the same amount of acid as in our stomach. If you're taking vitamins, put your vitamin in a little third of a glass of vinegar. And then let it sit for like 30 minutes. If the vitamin is not dissolving in the acid, just throw it away because you, you're just wasting your money. It means it's not getting absorbed. Uh, and that's why some people, when they pee, they see all this yellow stuff in the urine because of the vitamin just being right into the toilet. Uh, so um, diet-wise, it's more the, the Mediterranean diet, so more fruits and vegetables. Limit yourself to meat. My weakness are French fries. Uh, so I limit myself to French fries and a hamburger once a month. That's it. So I hadn't had one for February yet, so I do... Five guys, I love them. They put all those fries in that bag, <laughs> that nice burger. But you can't eat that every day. I go out for dinner to, to, uh, tonight, you know, have a steak and potatoes. I'm not going to get up tomorrow having waffles and pancakes. So it's all about the balance. Don't deprive yourself. You go out and have a piece of cake tonight. Uh, by the way, you go out to have that meal. That They give you enough food for two meals. When I sit down and cut it in half, the next thing is for lunch the next day, right? So it's all about proportion. You have waffles this morning. You cannot have um, your waffles and syrup. You cannot go out tonight and have a potato and, and and cake and all those different things. So fruits and vegetables, fish two or three times a week, um, all the leafy green vegetables and all the protein rich foods is what you need to be doing. By the way, if you want this, your doctor can make a referral to a nutritionist covered by your insurance. Hey, I have a patient with lupus. I want you to give them the guidelines of what the best food to treat the disease to prevent them from getting protein in the urine. Boom, write the prescription. It's covered by the insurance and they can make that evaluation. And actually, we do that for all our patients. I say, get them on the board because I want them to say, hey, what's low salt food so you're not making your blood pressure go up, low protein so we're not getting into the kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. So ask your doctor for a nutritionist. Dr. Wells, can I get a referral to a nutritionist? Oh, I don't think you need a nutritionist. You can just go out on your own line and look stuff up. Dr. Wells, do you mind just writing down that I asked you to refer me to a nutritionist and you didn't think it was worth, you didn't think it, was worth it, that I could do it online? And I, I'll get a copy of that you'll get that referral. <laughs> Next question. How do I know my doctor is doing their job properly? I feel things are going good for my daughter, but what if we are missing something? How would I know? But the easy way you know is how frequent they are seeing you. What are those interactions? Oh, you're looking good, Mrs. Smith. I'll see you in six months. You no, know, your lupus is stable. You're doing fine on the medication to make sure that remains that way. We're going to repeat your blood work and urine in three months, and I'll see you back in the clinic in three in six months. But every three months, I need to get that blood and that urine test. That's the way I know. The only way I know that your disease is under control, the only way I know you're having side effects from other medications, the only way I know that your kidneys are getting worse, and I got to do the test. And if I'm just not seeing you once a year because, oh, you're doing fine, that's not good. I'm not going to let my daughter come in once a year. Because when she comes in six months, a year later, guess what? She might already have one foot on in, in a dialysis center because I missed it. So, yeah, you might be doing okay. But when we do the blood work, part of the stuff like we talked about is looking at disease activity. But I'm also looking for side effects from the medications. Another way we tell, if anybody's on prednisone, if you're on more than five milligrams of prednisone a day, that's almost malpractice. And that's what we talk about. So those are things you talk about with your, with your doctor. I think we, oh, another one. You mentioned cereals about, you mentioned cereals. What about cornflakes and Cheerios? I have <laughs> oatmeal for breakfast three times a week and no meat. Uh, say that again. I, was, I thought it was just a chat was coming through on my phone here. I just wanted to look at that. Oh, I sa it says, you mentioned cereals. What about cornflakes and Cheerios? I have oatmeal for breakfast three times a week and no meat. So you see the TV commercials say Cheerios lower your cholesterol and prevent all the stuff. Has nothing to do with Cheerios, guys. It's all the vitamins that's in there, right? And so, you know, you want to have that stuff as well. So if you are eating Cheerios, I know people think it's gross, but you need to have skim milk. Okay. I know milk and all the stuff is not cheap anymore. Uh, and then I say, hey, you really want to beef up the Cheerios. I put some fresh blueberries, not this frozen stuff, not the stuff that's in the box. 
with preservatives. You get one some fresh blueberries or fresh strawberries. I like pecans in mine. I don't eat cereal anymore because I don't drink milk. I mean, all those kind of things is what you really want to have. And the pecans give you the protein. You get the um, the, the, uh, the natural oxidants from uh, strawberries and blueberries. You get all this stuff um, that you should have, and that's what you can do. So you eat that. But I say limit yourself to, to once or twice a week to cereal. And then the other days, believe it or not, it's going to sound crazy, guys. You need to have the protein. It's going to be an egg, boiled egg, avocado on a piece of whole uh, wheat toast. Uh, it's going to be um, a, a cheese. I mean, all those different things. Turkey, chopped sausage. Um, I don't eat pork. I, I eat like beef bacon once a week. So those kind of things are what you need to do. But it's the protein. Cheerios are good. Uh, but make sure, again, okay, can't drink skim milk. Okay, go for 2% or 1%. But put some other stuff in it. You want to get the, the blueberries, strawberries, bananas, pecans, all that kind of stuff you want to have in there. All right, how are we doing on time, Chris? I'm kind of looking at this. I know we got a lot of questions coming through. Uh, that was the last one, actually. Okay. Well, listen, I, let me, can I just make a summary? Because I, you, everybody hear me. I, I love the questions. This is what you should be asking your doctors and your providers. The lady who had the eight-year-old daughter, the lady with the lung disease, you're talking about, hey, what the food to do. Your doctor should be making these recommendations, getting you to the right people. And you are paying for that, guys. You are the customer. You write that copay. Your insurance is paying for all that stuff. I make money when I see patients. That's what I do. That's my profession. That's what I do for a living. And you need to demand that of your providers. And if they're not doing that, this is not 1960 where the doctors are like, God, you did whatever they said. You are the customer. And you want to make sure that they have your best interest in mind. Well, thank you all for your time. I wish you all the best. And I appreciate, you know, all of doing this. And thank you, Orenia, for the sponsorship. Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Wells. We really appreciate your time and expertise. We will now welcome Satara Bani Satter. Satara is a lupus patient, longtime volunteer at the Lupus Foundation of Northern California and has her master's degree in integrative health. Through turning around her own health through healthy lifestyle practices, she became fascinated by what patients with autoimmune disease could do to help themselves. She is the founder of Satara Health, where she coaches clients with chronic diseases one-on-one -on -one to help them make healthy behavior changes to improve their health and overall well-being. Well, welcome, Satara. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen quickly. Okay, does that look good? Everyone can see that? That's good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for welcoming me into the space. Thank you, LFNC, who has been really a source of support for me for so long, for the last 10 years as I've been um, engaging with the Lupus Foundation. So a little bit of a story about myself. I was diagnosed with SLE and lupus nephritis in 2001. I was 18 years old and the whole diagnosis was really overwhelming to me. I had a lot of joint pain, was exhausted all the time, and had overwhelming brain fog. I had to see so many different doctors, and I remember that one question I would always ask is what I could do to help myself. They didn't have a lot of answers for me at the time, other than that I should take my medications, avoid the sun, and rest as much as I could. This was what started me on my own journey that would help me to better manage my illness and live my best life possible. In my graduate program, I focused primarily on lupus and have read over 100 studies from around the world on everything from acupuncture to guided imagery to really learn more about what self-management strategies are more effective. Keep in mind that these are all alongside the standard care that we get from our doctor. So everything that I will be talking about are things that we can do on our own. Um, they are free for the most part and, and easy to incorporate. My hope is to share some of these with you. Uh, the session topic today, self-care, um, stress management, and sleep was chosen by you, um, the lupus patients that are part of the LFNC, in a survey that was sent out late last year by the Lupus Foundation. 
I believe that we'll all get the most from the presentation by making it as interactive as possible. So my one ask of you is that you keep the chat open and chime in as often as you can. I'm excited to get started, so let's begin. I want to start with one of the factors that has had a huge impact on any and all chronic illnesses, but especially autoimmune disease, and that is stress. How many of you can trace the initial onset of your illness or a flare to a period of stress in your life? I want to see if we can use the chat here. Let me bring this up. So go ahead and just um, write in the chat, give me a yes if that is true for you, that you can trace your, um, your diagnosis of lupus to stress. It turns out that of all the forms of stress, emotional stress has the most difficult impact on our systems. I've heard many lupus patients say that their illness started after going through a serious loss or major life event that caused them a great deal of stress. So financial concerns, relationship problems, life transitions like moving or starting a new job, worrying about health issues and social pressure are some of the most common sources of stress for most individuals. But for those living with autoimmune disease, these are intensified due to the unpredictable nature of the illness and the daily strain that it puts on our relationships, finances, and abilities to work. Studies have found that patients with SLE suffer from higher, higher daily stress compared to the general population. So what can we do to keep stress from ruining our health? Because as much as we try, it's a part of our day-to-day -day lives. There's something we can do, and that is to create regular outlets for our stress so it doesn't wreak havoc on our health. To illustrate this point, let's think of the analogy of a pressure cooker. So a pressure cooker, many of you have seen one, now we have Instapots. But it's basically a container that accumulates tension inside. In order to release that tension, there's a valve, the little black and silver thing on the top, and it consistently and regularly releases steam. What this does is it regulates the internal pressure and also it keeps the pressure cooker from exploding. It can be the same with the tension and stress that build up in our lives. We often can't prevent the stress from happening, but what we can do is create regular and consistent outlets for its release. Open this up a little more so you can just see my full screen. So how we release stress is going to look different for everyone. And I'd love to hear more about the ways in which you release stress. I want to start here, however, on some of the proven ways to effectively release stress. Physical activity, especially aerobic exercise, has been shown to reduce stress hormones and to trigger the release of endorphins, which promote a positive mood. Relaxation techniques such as reading, listening to music, or taking a warm bath, getting a massage, making art, there may be others that you practice. There are so many and they're really individualized to what helps you to just decompress. Spending time in nature, taking a walk outside, going on a hike or just sitting in the park and listening to the birds sing. Nature has been shown to relieve stress in and of itself. And there's a whole body of evidence for something called ecotherapy, which is the study of how nature really heals us from the inside out. Spending time with friends, family, and your community is another great stress relief. And this is especially so if people are supportive and understanding about your illness. Conversely, spending time with people who downplay your symptoms or they don't understand what you are going through can actually have the opposite effect. This has been found in studies. 
Living with a chronic illness like lupus can be particularly isolating, and it's very important to lean into relationships with people who are supportive and or if they are going through the same thing. Joining one of the lupus support groups can be a wonderful way to speak to other patients who are going through the same thing as you. Journaling is another method that it is very effective as a constructive outlet, um, just a way to get your thoughts down on paper and to gain perspective. Restorative sleep, which I will get more into later. Um, and I have one more big one, and some of you might guess what that is and that's meditation and mindfulness. This is the other major practice that releases stress. Let's start with the definition of what each one is. Meditation is a practice that involves training the mind to focus and redirect our thoughts. It typically involves techniques that encourage relaxation, concentration, awareness, and an increased sense of presence in the moment. Meditation has been practiced for centuries in various cultures and spiritual traditions around the world. While there are many different types of meditation, most involve finding a quiet space, sitting or lying down in a comfortable position, and then using a specific technique to guide the mind into a state of deep relaxation and heightened awareness. Common meditation techniques include mindfulness meditation, which involves focusing on the breath or on a bodily sensation, guided visualization, which involves imagining peaceful scenes or positive outcomes. Meditation has been shown to have numerous health benefits, including reducing stress, anxiety, depression, improving focus and awareness, emotional regulation, and promoting a sense of well-being and inner peace. Many people also practice meditation as a spiritual or religious discipline, using it to deepen their connections with themselves, with others, or with a higher power. Mindfulness is a mental state characterized by non-judgmental awareness of the present moment, including thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, and the surrounding environment. It involves paying deliberate attention to what is happening in the present moment without getting up in judgment or reactions. While mindfulness is also practiced through meditation techniques such as mindfulness meditation, it can also be cultivated through various everyday activities such as eating, walking, or even washing dishes. The key is to bring your full attention and awareness to the activity that's at hand. So by now, most of us have heard of meditation and mindfulness and maybe have internalized some message about how we should be doing it. It's very common also to resist incorporating it into our routine for various reasons. So it could be um, our perceived lack of time, challenges sitting still um, due to a restless mind or physical discomfort, like physically just not being able to sit for that long. Uh, difficulty quiet, quieting the mind or difficulty establishing a routine. Sorry, I lost my face here. It's very common to, oh, we talked about this. So what we, I want to spend a moment to share some of the benefits of a regular practice and also how to make the practice more accessible and enjoyable for yourself. So why should we spend our time meditating? Meditation activates your body's relaxation response. So it's not constantly in fight or flight mode. So some of you have heard this term of fight or flight. And what it is, is it's a physiological response that occurs in response to a perceived threat or danger, triggering a cascade of physiological changes in the body to prepare the body to either confront the threat, which is to fight, or flee, which is the flight response. It's an evolutionary adaptation that has helped our ancestors survive life-threatening situations. And when the brain perceives a threat, the amygdala, which is part of the brain's limbic system, responsible for processing emotions, activates the body's stress response system. It triggers the release of hormones, such as adrenaline and cortisol, into the bloodstream. 
These physiological changes prepare the body to react quickly and effectively to perceived danger, increasing the chances of survival. Once the threat has passed, the body's stress response system typically returns to its normal state and the body resumes its normal functions. While the fight or flight response can be helpful in situations where immediate action is necessary, prolonged or frequent activation of this response due to chronic stress can have negative effects on our physical and mental health. Regular mindfulness meditation could lead to a decrease in stress hormones, such as cortisol. Lower cortisol means that your body is not constantly experiencing stress. Mindfulness have been, has been found to help with emotional regulation. In short, it helps you become more aware of your thoughts and your emotions without becoming overwhelmed by them. Many of us with lupus also suffer from an, an inability to focus. And meditation and mindfulness helps us practice focusing our attention on the present moment instead of our thoughts. This practice can help in other areas of our lives where we need to focus and keep our attention on one thing. Meditation and mindfulness has been found to result in better sleep quality. And as we know, and we'll learn about later, better sleep is essential for our overall well being. These practices also promote resilience by helping us become more aware of our experiences without reacting to them negatively. In doing research for my master's thesis, which was called Addressing Unmet Needs in Lupus Care, I came across several studies on mindfulness-based interventions and how they impact the lives of lupus patients. The one study in particular that I'd like to highlight here, there was a single blind randomized controlled trial studying mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, looking at psychological symptoms and quality of life for patients who had lupus. 23 patients received the intervention, which was eight sessions of yoga, formal meditation, or daily mindfulness practices alongside their standard medical care. Another 23 just received the standard medical care without doing the eight sessions of mindfulness. The researchers found that at the end of the intervention, that there was a significant difference between the group that received the mindfulness intervention in terms of fewer psychological symptoms like anxiety and depression and their self-reported psychological quality of life. And this benefit even continued for six months after the in intervention. In addition, the group that received the mindfulness intervention had better self-reported social functioning post-treatment, and the results continued for six months after the intervention. Pretty cool, right? And there was a few of these that were done around the world looking at these um, mindfulness-based um, stress redu reduction techniques with lupus patients. Starting a meditation practice can be really simple and doesn't require a significant time requirement. Here are some tips for getting started if you'd like to reap the benefits, especially if you've been resisting or finding it challenging to make the time. So the first tip is to really just start small, begin with just a few minutes of meditation each day. You can gradually increase the duration as you become more comfortable and even two to five minutes can make a difference in how you feel. Choose a convenient time. So find a time that works for you. It could be in the morning, um, during a break at work or before bed. Consistency is really key. So try to establish a regular meditation routine. One thing that can be helpful is linking it to an existing habit that you have every day. For example, if you brush your teeth in the morning every day, you can sit down for meditation right after you brush your teeth. Or if you have another habit that you practice, you take your medication at a certain time, you can sit down for meditation after that. Um, often, if you want to make habits stick, you link them to something that you do every day. So it just becomes a regular, um, like natural next step for you. 
You can use guided meditation. So consider using these, especially if you're new to meditation. Um, there, are, there are several apps and online resources where you can find guided sessions um, that provide in instruction so that you have a focal point for your attention. This is especially good if you have a hard time um, focusing. Um, Headspace and Calm are two of the popular apps. And I found that if you are a member of your local library, oftentimes you can get Headspace um, for free, which is pretty cool. Uh, Insight Timer is my favorite and that one is always free. So that's worth checking out as well. Um, the next tip is to find a comfortable space. So if you have um, physical discomfort, and sitting still is a limitation. Just create a comfortable space. And meditation can even be done lying down, believe it or not. Um, otherwise, if you're sitting up, you can use a lot of pillows or blankets, um, or you can even sit in your favorite chair to meditate. You don't have to sit um, cross-legged on the floor, contrary to what a lot of people think. Um, explore with different techniques. So you can explore different meditation techniques to find what suits you. And it could include um, mindfulness meditation, uh, loving kindness, which is where you focus on sending love to others in your life and to yourself. Or you can use focused breathing exercises and you can find a lot of those online as well. Um, if sitting meditation feels challenging, you can try incorporating mindfulness into daily activities. So we, we talked about this. This is just being fully present when you're doing one task. So it could be like washing your hands and feeling the warm water, um, smelling the soap, feeling the traction of your hands against each other. Um, this can bring you into the present moment and to help you to not focus and uh, identify so much with your thoughts or your worries. Always remember, of course, in the bottom there um, is to be kind to yourself. It's completely normal during meditation for your mind to wander. Um, and instead of getting frustrated, you can gently bring your focus back to the chosen point of your attention. And be patient with yourself as you develop your practice, if this is something that you chose to do. And remember that the benefits of meditation often come with consistency rather than duration. And by making meditation a really small and manageable part of your daily routine, you might find it easier to overcome resistance and to find a practice that works for you. The next topic I'd like to focus on is sleep and why it's so very important to our overall health as patients living with an autoimmune disease. Sleep is crucial for everyone's health, but it's particularly important for individuals with autoimmune disease due to its role in regulating the immune system. Here's why sleep is especially important, important for those living with autoimmune disease. The first is immune system regulation. So sleep plays a really important role in regulating the immune system, including the production and activity of your immune cells. Getting enough sleep helps maintain a balanced immune system. Inflammation reduction. So autoimmune diseases often have chronic inflammation and sleep deprivation can ex exasperate inflammation by increasing the levels of inflammatory markers that we have in the body. And this has been found in studies as well. Tissue repair and healing. So sleep is a time when the body undergoes repair and a regenerative process. It's during sleep that damaged tissues are repaired and the body heals itself. And lastly is, is symptom management. So lack of sleep can really worsen symptoms or make them seem worse, such as fatigue, pain, and brain fog, um, which are some of the most common symptoms in lupus. It's also been found that it leads to more daytime sleepiness. And one of the most common things we complain about as lupus patients is feeling tired all the time. Believe it or not, setting yourself for a good, up for a good night's sleep starts when you open your eyes in the morning. And it has to do with your circadian rhythm or your body's natural sleep-wake cycle. 
This internal biological clock is responsible for our sleepiness and wakefulness over a 24 hour period. It controls the production of melatonin, which is a hormone that regulates sleep. So optimizing our circadian rhythms can significantly improve our sleep quality. Some things you can do to optimize your circadian rhythm are Expose yourself to natural sunlight during the day, and especially in the morning. Sunlight exposure helps regulate the circadian rhythm by signaling to your body that it's time for you to be awake. You can spend time outdoors or near windows or consider using light therapy lamps if natural light is limited, like in the winter, um, here in Northern California, we just had like a period of so many days of rain um, and I got myself a, a therapy light, which emits it's uh, 10,000 lux of light. And I just put it close to my face um, when I wake up in the morning. And it really helps. It helps with the winter blues and just kind of to wake your body up and let you know that it's morning, especially when it's dark outside for so long as it often is. Um, I know that there are restrictions that we have for um, sun exposure, and that's okay. You can, you know, wear a hat when you go outside. So in other words, you can wear a hat to shield your skin from the sun, but don't wear sunglasses in the morning. Um, what you want is you want your eyes to absorb that light so it triggers to your body that it's morning and it can start that 24-hour cycle that is so natural to us. As the sun starts to go down in the afternoon or in the evening, depending on what season we are, consider also dimming the lights in your home. This sends a signal to your brain that it's time to wind down and it optimizes melatonin production, which helps you sleep at night. Most importantly, and many of us are guilty of this, try to limit your exposure to artificial light from electronic devices before bed. Smartphones, tablets, and computers emit a blue light, which signals wakefulness in your brain, and it suppresses melatonin production. So one good practice is to put your phone on the charger two hours before going to sleep, or you can use um, blue light blocking glasses if you read on a tablet or if you need to be on your computer. Um, this blocks the blue light from going into your eyes and signaling to your body that it should be awake. There are also apps that you can install on your devices. And what they do is they naturally dim the light emitted from them in the evening. Um, I use one on my computer or my laptop if I have to be on it late at night. And it's called um, F Lux. You can do a um, Google search and find it. It's free and you can um, download and install it on your computer or your um, iPad. Optimizing and aligning with our circadian rhythm is a factor in good sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene refers to a set of practices and habits that promote healthy sleep patterns and improve the quality of sleep. Here are some aspects of sleep hygiene and how to practice them. So the first one is to maintain a consistent sleep schedule. So you go to bed and you wake up at the same time every day, even on the weekends. Consistency helps regulate your body's internal clock and promotes better sleep quality. Um, so just having a consistent schedule, probably the more important one is what time you go to bed every day, um, but trying to wake up at the same time is really helpful too. Creating a relaxing bedtime routine. So this signals to your body that it's time to wind down. Um, this include, can include doing activities like reading a book, taking a warm bath, um, practicing relaxation techniques such as deep breathing, meditation, or doing some gentle stretching. Optimizing your sleep environment. So making your bedroom conducive to sleep by keeping it, the three things are keeping it cool, keeping it dark and keeping it quiet. So using blackout curtains or an eye mask to block out artificial light, using earplugs or a white noise machine to mask disruptive sounds and ensuring your mattress or pillow and pillows are comfortable and supportive. 
So limiting exposure to screens before bed. So we talked about this, um, about the blue light. So the goal is to really stop using um, electronic devices two or maybe one hour before bedtime, whatever you can manage, or using the um, light blocking glasses or screen filters if you have to be on your devices in the evening. Um, the next one is avoiding stimulants and heavy meals before bed. So stimulants like caffeine and nicotine, as well as heavy meals close to bedtime can disrupt our sleep, our ability to fall asleep and the quality of our sleep. So a good rule of thumb is to stop having caffeine after 12 p.m. So your body has the time to metabolize the caffeine before you go to bed. Exercising regularly, so engaging in regular physical activity, but try to avoid vigorous exercise close to bedtime as it can be too stimulating. Exercising early, earlier in the day can promote deeper and more restorative sleep. Limiting naps. So while short naps can be really beneficial, especially for improving our alertness and our mood, Avoid long or late afternoon naps as these can interfere with our ability to fall asleep at night. So it can really eat into our nighttime sleep. And of course, managing stress. So um, mindfulness, yoga, progressive muscle relaxation helps um, manage stress and promote relaxation before bedtime. Um, another technique is if you have a lot of on your mind, I'm, I'm one of those people who my mind is like always going and sometimes it prevents me from sleeping. You can practice doing something called a brain dump. So you get a journal or just a piece of paper and you write down everything that is on your mind in that moment. Um, so this way you're not holding it all in your mind as you're trying to sleep. And I found this to be very effective for myself. So I invite you to try it if that's something that you um, struggle with as well. And then limiting alcohol. So it's a bit of a misconception that alcohol leads to better sleep. Research has shown that while drinking alcohol before bed can help people to fall asleep faster, they're also more likely to wake up more frequently during the night and have lower sleep quality overall. One rule of thumb is to not consume any alcohol four hours before bed so you can give your body time to metabolize the alcohol. And then of course, seek professional help if needed. If you can, are consistently struggling with sleep despite practicing good sleep hygiene, consider consulting a healthcare professional or sleep specialist. There could be other factors at play like sleep apnea, uh, restless leg syndrome, um, depression, um, mood issues that are um, interfering with your sleep. That is good to get addressed. And last, but definitely not least, I'd love to discuss self-care, which are the intentional actions we can take to improve our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. As you know, we are whole people. We're not, it's not just our physical self. We have an emotional side, a mental side that we have to take care of in our spirit as well. So we've already covered many of the aspects of how we can support our physical health with the talk from uh, Dr. Wells, um, improving our sleep, our mental health through setting up regular outlets for stress and starting a meditation or a mindfulness practice. And our emotional health deserves just as much recognition. And as someone living with the unpredictability of an autoimmune disease, our emotions can often feel like a roller coaster. I found that practicing self-compassion to be such an important aspect of my self-care. And this basically means treating myself with the same understanding, gentleness, and compassion that I would give to a friend or a loved one. This also involves speaking kindly to myself and without judgment, even when I make mistakes. Practicing emotional self-care involves nurturing and supporting your emotional well-being. And some effective ways to practice emotional self-care is to identify and validate your emotions. So taking time to recognize and acknowledge your feelings without judgment, 
validating your emotions as natural responses to your experiences, uh, whether or not you perceive them as positive or negative. Expressing yourself, so finding he healthy outlets for expressing your emotions, such as journaling, talking to a trusted friend, a therapist, or engaging in creative activities like art, music, or dance. Setting boundaries, so especially uh, establishing clear boundaries to protect your emotional well-being and to honor your needs. So learning to say no to requests or situations that you find um, drain your energy or compromise your values. Practicing self-compassion. So we talked about this, training yourself with kindness, understanding, and self-compassion, especially when you know that you're going through a difficult time. Um, practicing self-talk that is supportive and nurturing uh, rather than critical or harsh. And interestingly enough, um, if you choose or have already chosen to take up a meditation or mindfulness practice, you become so much more aware of how you speak to yourself and, and what are the thoughts that are going on inside your mind from a moment to moment basis. Limiting exposure to negative influences. So uh, minimize exposure to negative people, environments, or media uh, that can exasperate negative emotions. Surrounding yourself with positive influences and sources of inspiration. Seeking support, reaching out to friends, family members, mental health professionals for support when you're struggling emotionally. Uh, having a supportive network can provide validation, empathy, and perspective. And this is especially important when you're living with lupus, just finding people who understand um, your struggles and what you're going through. And again, I think the um, support groups are a wonderful way to do that. Engage in, in activities that bring you joy. So make time for activities that bring you joy, bring you pleasure, fulfillment, whether it's spending time in nature, um, pursuing hobbies or interests, or enjoying time with loved ones. Um, prioritizing these activities really nourish your soul. Of course, if you're experiencing persistent or overwhelming emotional distress, consider seeking the help of a mental health professionals such as a therapist or a counselor. They can provide guidance, support, and coping strategies to help you navigate your emotions more effectively. And remember that emotional self-care is an ongoing process and it requires self-awareness, self-compassion, and practice. But by incorporating these strategies into your routine, you can nurture your emotional well-being and build resilience in the face of challenges. Again, I want to just thank you so much for your time. I hope that you got at least one takeaway from this presentation that you'll start incorporating into your day-to-day -day life. Um, education without action is just information. And it's really by incorporating some small steps that you can start on the path to helping yourself feel better. I welcome any questions about any of the topics we covered today or even something that we didn't cover. If it feels more comfortable for you to reach out to me one-on-one, -on -one, please feel free to email me or send me a message through my website, which is listed here, satarahealth.com. I'm going to stop my share. Thank you, Satara, for your presentation. It was great. I learned a lot, a lot of useful information there. Now we will open the Q&A portion of the event. We will begin with the questions that were asked during the presentation. Feel free to ask additional questions while we are talking. We will try to get through as many questions as we can live, and we'll email you answers to any questions that we are not able to get to today. One question here, what was the free meditation app that you mentioned? Oh, um, so the one I like is called Insight Timer. I can put it, let's see if I can put it here. I don't think I have a way to um, send it 
to everyone, but insight, like if you have an, an insight, like an idea, and then timer is the name of it. So you can look it up in, in the app store. Um, it's really, it just has like a really wide variety of guided meditations and even just a timer. If you want to sit for five minutes and you want a timer with a little bell at the end, um, I use that every morning and I really like it. The other ones are Headspace and Calm. And I found that through my local library, the Saratoga library, um, I think it was Calm. I can't remember if it was Calm or Headspace, but you can get it for free. And they have um, programs on there for if you're a beginner, like just pro progressing through um, starting a meditation practice. Um, being a lupus patient yourself, what do you do to de-stress on a daily basis? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I guess it's changed over the years. Um, these days I'm a mom. I have a five-year-old. I work. I juggle a lot of different things. And um, my meditation practice has really sustained me. I can't do too long because I have busy mornings, like trying to um, help my daughter get out the door for school, but I do about 10 minutes every day and I'm consistent with it. And I, I do what I talked about. I link it to my morning routine. So when I, after I brush my teeth, I sit down and I do my meditation every day and it really just gets, helps me to like center and get my day to a really good start. And if I don't do it, I know because it, um, I feel like something's missing and I didn't quite start my day on a good note. Um, other things I really love are being outside. So I do most of my exercise outside. Um, I try to go to the park, um, just like hearing the sound of the birds and like getting the fresh air, I think has been really beneficial for me. Um, I do yoga. So I find classes at my local gym and I go to those. All of them are really gentle. None of these crazy vinyasas or hatha yoga, I find that the exercise that's most gentle is probably what's best for me. So yeah, those are just three things that I do, but it's, it definitely has changed over the years as I became a mom and um, that put more on my plate, I guess. Uh, any recommendations of food that helps sleep? That is a great question. Um, I do, so it's not a food, but chamomile tea is really lovely for sleep. Um, if you find that you are like trying to just wind down from a really busy day, that's a great way to just like brew yourself a little chamomile tea. Um, they say magnesium is very good for sleep as well. So if that's something that you take as part of your supplement regimen, maybe trying to take it at night, um, and seeing if that helps. Um, there's a bunch of supplements that are out there from like melatonin that I've tried. I'm probably not in a great position to recommend supplements, but it's something that you can talk to your physician about and try to see what, um, helps you. Oh, I had a question myself. Do you know okay. if blue light glasses are safe to be worn outside as well? Um, why would you want to wear them outside? I'm just curious. I don't know. Sometimes you just like wear glasses because they look cute, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why not. I mean, the, the whole point of them is just to block the blue light from your devices. Um, but I don't see why there would be any issue if you wanted to wear them outside. It probably just wouldn't do anything. <laughs> I was just curious. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. I'm not getting any other questions on my end. Okay. But feel free to keep adding them into the chat. Mm. 
Hmm. Should we give them a minute or two? Sure. Yeah, let's give a minute or two. Um, everyone, remember, you can ask your questions anonymously, too, if you feel like. Um, something that we didn't mention earlier, uh, Satara has done a great job about talking about the support group programs that we do offer, but we also offer, um, if you don't feel like being in a group, um, which right now are all online, it's not in person, uh, we also have the Buddy Program, which is a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship with a, a lupus patient who's had lupus for a while. Um, and it works really well if you've newly diagnosed or or um, have had it for a while, but just haven't had somebody to talk to. Um, we we pair you with a, another lupus patient, and then they you guys can just chat about symptoms or you know how you deal with things or or things much like Satara has said today. Um, so it's a great program. It's free and it it is also uh, virtual. So you can find all the information on that on our website as well. Yeah, it's it's really it's so different to talk to other people that have been through something similar than to try to explain it to friends or family members that they're trying to be compassionate, but they don't really understand what it's like. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I found that to be a really great resource. I think we have some questions in the chat. Um, any recommendations for a child? In terms of what? Um, meditation or mindfulness or any particular thing? Feel free to just add to that. Meditation, mindfulness. Yeah, I, I do it with my daughter. So if you, if you end up downloading that, um, insight timer, um, there's a whole library of things that you can do with kids on there. And they'll be really short, like maybe two minutes. And my daughter is five and she's been doing it probably since she was like three. Um, but just takes them through like breathing, really simple, like little stories or analogies to help them understand what they're doing. And it comes in really healthy, uh, um, helpful when they're having a moment, as we know as parents, where they're like, can't control their anger or their emotions. They have these big emotions that come up. And like, right in that moment, you can practice the breathing with them. And I found that really helpful with my daughter. And sometimes she'll, I try to get my meditation in before she comes into my room in the morning, but sometimes she'll sneak in when I'm in the middle of it and she'll just come and sit down right next to me and we'll just sit there until the timer goes off and then she knows she can talk or you know tickle or you know whatever she wants to do yeah we have another question here it says I know you said you were recently working on more schooling as well as having a child I work full-time as well as being a full-time student. Sometimes I feel like my schedule is too overwhelming. How do you manage with stress management while balancing an overly full schedule? Yeah. I would say the first thing is to just uh, be mindful of how much you are putting on your plate and make sure that like the activities that you're doing are really necessary and they're working towards the values and the goals that you have in your life. Um, and if it is exciting things like, you know, uh, you know, being a student, like pursuing something that you really want to do. And then of course, a lot, most of us have to work. Um, finding regular outlets, as I said, like think back to that pressure cooker, you know, it's like all these things are happening inside and they're inducing stress, even if they're not negative, they're just demands on our lives and the heat is circulating and like that little nozzle on the top is just releasing. So that releasing can be taking a hike in nature, taking a yoga class, you know, taking a couple hours to yourself, whatever it is for you, find ways just consistently throughout your week to release that pressure so that you can 
kind of get back to a state where your cup is full and then you can be present for yourself and for others in your life. Thank you for that question. I see how that just making sure she's feeling okay in her body and helping her understand a little more. Yeah, those practices are good. Check check out the insight timer and then uh, look up kids or children and you'll find a lot of good resources. Sorry, was someone gonna say something, Lori? No, I was just gonna read that question. Ah. <clears throat> Here's another question. I taught first grade and have done mindfulness in the classroom. We place stuffed animals, buddies on our belly and can see how our benefits go in and out. So very calming and intentional. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. We place stuffed animals on our belly. Yeah, that's really good um I've seen it done with like little um like puffs that they even can put in front of their nose to like see you know how it moves with the air um yeah it's really it's eye-opening for kids and they they remember it my daughter was doing it in preschool and she still remembers and they did yoga too and she remembers that and like sitting and breathing I'm glad that we're teaching these things to kids from a younger age because I didn't come across it until way later in life when I, I really needed it um, because of managing my lupus. I don't think we have any more questions. So I think we can wrap it up now. Thank you again to our presenters. I hope everyone learned something new today. I know I did. If you want to rewatch today's conference, it will be available on demand next week. Watch for an email with the link. Please be sure to take this survey you will receive via email. This will help us find topics which are interesting to you and know how the conferences can be improved. For additional resources or questions, please visit our website at www.lfnc.org or email us at, at communications at lfnc.org. I hope you all had a good day today and that you will join us for our other lupus health conferences this year. Watch our social media website or your emails for more information. Thank you for joining us today and have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.